work that we are doing on this uh, human robot autonomy. And uh, several of us have shown this slide, uh, which is this uh, trying to get autonomy by combining the ability to perceive, to think, and to act. So this is, in fact, what drives a lot of my research, is to try to put these three things together. And just to uh, illustrate this, I'm going to show this uh, robot soccer video. Oops, I'm sorry. Well, I was going to show a robot soccer video. Where is this? Just a second, sorry. Mm. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, there we go. Okay. And uh, can I have this? Okay. So what matters here is that these are really computers. Forget that they look cute like dogs. It doesn't really matter at all. They are computers that have a camera uh, at the end of their little kind of like face. And they can communicate with each other, which is also something that we cannot visually see, but they are talking wirelessly all the time at 60 hertz, 60 times per second they talk with each other. And they are coordinating and doing these all autonomously. So what's remarkable here is not the one that goes to the ball, because that's the easy part, is this one here that actually does not see the ball now, like uh, the example that Josh was say showing, or someone was showing about something disappears. But because they are talking, this one is a model of where the ball is and acts accordingly. So it's acting as a supporter attacker, so it comes all the way down. This one is like following a ball, okay? This is a very simple behavior. But this one, even now, it's remarkable that it sees the ball, but does not go to the ball because they are exchanging who should do what, and therefore this one decides I'm closest, and they negotiate, and they decide you go. And this one continues kind of like on its task, going to supporting the attack, and this one continues going to the ball, eventually aims at the goal, and uh, beautifully this one as a supporter attacker is able to switch role and eventually score. So what I'm trying to say is that this is like um, not a science fiction. This is not waving our hands. This actually happens. This is just one out of many kind of like, how do you say, complete systems that kind of like uh, demonstrates this integration of perception, cognition, and action. And uh, what I'll be talking about today is a different system, this robot that's a service robot that led to several PhD theses that leads and moves at CMU uh, autonomously everywhere. And I'll explain what's going on here. So my, what I'll say today is um, a really uh, uh, divided into two parts. I'll mention first how they are, are they autonomous, and then I'll explain about the humans. So what's remarkable about this robot is that besides it does, it does it all by itself, it also has goals, which is go to some particular place, and it stops at the right place. So stopping at the right place doesn't seem as cool as a goal, but it's better than scoring a goal. It's really difficult after moving in a 350 office space, stop at the right place. So the first thing that these robots do is actually they uh, execute, they do tasks. They go to locations, they escort visitors to my office. This is Eric Korvitz being escorted to my office. He was generous enough to send me the video. I don't have many videos of any uh, people being escorted to my office, though more than 400 visitors have been escorted to my office by the robot who meets the person at the elevator and then they just drive down these corridors and the human is supposed to follow this robot uh, until they get to my office, which happens to be further away. So what, well, how does this work? And uh, I, I'm very uh, thankful for this invitation and humbled by and seeing how much, how complex humans are after all. <laughs> we know they are very complex, but uh, it's really amazing. I mean, the, 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 the research with the children, the research with the brain, I mean, it's remarkable. But these robots basically have uh, sensors, and in this case, they have a laser sensor for obstacle avoidance only, and they have a Kinect, which is this depth camera, and basically they have a computer on board and motors. So just to explain that laser range sender, what it does, is the, the, the laser just sends like a, 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 a scan, an array, 
that returns to the computer the distance of the obstacles at only that height is a 2D scan, uh, just one uh, particular height where we put the, the, the sensor and the robot or the computer receives this information, which is basically two lines of some, at some particular distance and open at the end because this is kind of a corridor. As opposed to this uh, laser ra range finder, a depth sensor instead looks at a range in front of it, but in the 3D space, and it's capable of returning to the computer uh, where the obstacles are in the 3D space, which we call a point cloud. So basically what this robot has to do, and uh, this navigation and localization, is that it needs to look at some kind of depth image and given a map that could have been learned or uh, the floor plans of the, of the building, it needs to really detect walls as planar surfaces in its image. So basically the robot, we have this very, and it needs to do this in real time. So the robot looks at an image like this one, samples points on the image, and is able to find very effectively, and this is like one of the things of robotics, see, they need to work in real time, very effectively the planar surfaces of an image. And therefore, when the robot moves, this is what happens, is that the robot, in some sense, has uncertainty of its position in the, in the map, and eventually when it is able to see a little bit of that wall, which is here in its vision, plus a corner, the, the uncertainty reduces and the robot navigates beautifully in the environment. So basically the robot knows where it is because it's able to uh, localize uh, in this environment. And uh, that enables the robot to uh, here is a demonstration of this localization, enables it to go anywhere. So look how challenging this is from a sensing point of view, as this is like a wooden floor and a wide, a very wide hall, and then it enters this very bright kind of bridge, glass bridge, all in glass, and uh, if, uh, sometimes there is a lot of sun here, very, very bright. And then there is this very bad transition between uh, wood and carpet because there's a bump, and that bump is not very good for the computers on board, so we made the robot uh, slow down over the bump. The reason why the robot slows down there is because it's so well localized that it knows exactly that it's at that bump. It's not because it actually sees the bump, it doesn't detect any bump. It's because it knows its XY location in the building, which actually uh, maps into where the robot is supposed to slow down. So this is Joy Deep Pizvaz who did this. So this is very important to understand that um, uh, to, to make these robots available, there is also a big challenge, which is these uh, concept of varying environments. So what happens is like this. Uh, when the robot has to navigate in these spaces that have a lot of like uh, objects that change, like tables and chairs, so it's not the walls, uh, if the robot learns this environment, tomorrow the tables are in different position, the chairs are in different position, and the robot basically gets lost immediately because it starts seeing its uh, prior knowledge of the map does not match what it's seeing, and the robot is always going to think it's at a different point. So my student invented this kind of like very beautiful concept of dividing the perception into long-term features, which are all the obstacles that match the map, to short-term features, which are the things that change, uh, but are this, don't change within the local view of the robot, and eventually dynamic features. So what he did, was in his thesis, he introduced this concept of episodic non-Markov localization in which, uh, let's say, a, a decision about the state of the robot at time n, uh, let alone it doesn't matter i plus one or i plus two at times i, depends on its Markovian in terms of the short-term features and, uh, I'm sorry, the long-term features and only depends on the previous state but all the short-term features are used non-Markovian way, which means from a mathematical point of view, 
the robot tries to use what it sees in a completely different way. What matches what's like uh, static, like walls, is processed in a way that you don't have to remember what you saw before because the information at this moment is sufficient to make decisions. But everything else that is changing, it tries to use for consistency and tries to find where it is such that all these observations are consistent with each other. So if I move 10 centimeters forward, and if I move turn 10 degrees, as the robot knows its motion, it now uh, knows how, where it is with respect to those local features. And that enabled the robot to, this is at NYU, uh, the robot was, uh, all summer of 2013, three of, two of them, uh, we brought them to NYU, and in one day, they were moving in a completely different scenario. This was a, a center for urban science and progress, CUSP, that, at NYU, in which the robot moved around. All these kind of like uh, cubicles were not part of the map in the floor plans of the building, and the robot had no problem moving in the whole building just by being given, which he could have learned the map, but he was given the floor plans, which we downloaded from the internet, and it stops for every single service and moved more, I believe, more than uh, 200 kilometers in this building, uh, in this uh, floor, uh, everywhere uh, by itself. So, this is the first kind of thing that I, I wanted to share is the ability for the robot to actually move. So our cell phones are great, our computers are great, but they don't move. While these robots potentially, uh, hopefully, uh, move. Another beautiful thing that they do is this concept of accumulating data, and they collect data. So this is the cobot moving around and collecting Wi-Fi data and creating the most accurate data, the maps that exist, in which because the robot, as opposed to humans, knows exactly where it is in the building, up to five centimeters of error, GPS outdoors gives you one to two meters, uh, one to three meters of error, and uh, we don't have GPS indoors, so our algorithms are able to uh, do this very uh, accurate localization, and then the robot can know exactly where it is, also gathering uh, data independently from angle and does all sorts of behaviors and collects this data. It can collect data accurately about anything in the environment. For example, at NYU, we collected uh, temperature in the building at different times of the day and uh, well, so the humidity and noise level and uh, all sorts of other sensors we had on board, and we could see the differences, and these would be uh, data that uh, comes just by having a robot that moves around. Just to mention one more thing that uh, came up this morning when uh, Stan was also talking, uh, these robots also do their own self-exploration. So they actually generate their own goals. They go, so these robots here, uh, when we see it doing this, it's because it found out that it needed more data in this region. So it's not programmed to do this. It's actually by itself generates goals that are able to uh, fill in the gaps of the data that is being collected in tasks. So it's a very beautiful concept that the robot is trying to uh, maximize uh, the distribution or make it more uniform, the distribution of data, so when it's not doing a task, it just goes by itself. In fact, uh, believe it or not, sometimes we are at CMU and uh, we don't know where the robot is. It just disappears, leaves the lab and goes to the ninth floor and goes to the seventh floor and we have no clue where this thing is unless we go to some computer and some interface and we figure this out. Otherwise, it just is on its own. And so, it, and if you task it, it's trying to use, it's a very interesting algorithm. We tries to use like uh, when it's tasked to come to my office at three and it's only 2.30, it says I'm going to go through that path. What's in within reach outside of my path? How much can I deviate from the task I'm supposed to do to maximize my learning? So it's very active in terms of actually uh, trying to learn a model of Wi-Fi or temperature or whatever you decide or just how many people are in the building, 
uh, by itself. So it has, I don't know, we don't call this free will, uh, we don't call this self, but it does create its own goals and is just, to, now however, it's only trying to uh, get a, a uniform distribution of data from the, all the locations in the building. But it does that, and this is a thesis of one of my students, Max Corrain, who is, uh, well, he's going to finish sometime. And, uh, and then, uh, and then uh, beautifully, this robot, uh, these robots, have, we have four of them, have moved in our buildings, and here is the NYU building, uh, more than uh, a thousand kilometers completely by themselves. And you have to understand that this concept of moving in the building without being followed by any person, it's really unique. So I entered this uh, academy here and I did not see any robots move around. I went to any place in Rome and I couldn't see any robots move around. Uh, if you come to CMU, you see them moving around and nobody follows them. They are just on their own moving around. They only transport things from one place to another, but they are very robust. So this is about their autonomy in terms of just motion. And now I'll mention now what happens with the humans and how do they interact with the humans. So what happens is the following. Unfortunately, these robots don't have arms. So they have limitations. And they cannot pick up objects. They cannot uh, uh, press elevator buttons. And uh, in, inevitably, our good friends, the learning friends like we are machine learning also, if we do machine learning, it's still hard to believe that we'll be able to learn to open any door of the world. Uh, so there is this thing about uh, in uh, 2014, I had this realization, I, mean, it, it, I think it was at 3 a.m. in the morning or something, that I woke up and said, this is it. We are not going to wait that they can do it all. And we are going to try to have them be in a symbiotic autonomy in which they can ask for help. So our robots, uh, how can I say, assume their limitations, and I believe they will always have limitations, cognitive limitations, perceptual limitations, actuation limitations, and they move in the world asking for help when they cannot do something. So they have traversed all these floors of our building, taking the elevator by asking humans to press elevator buttons. So here is the robot, how it functions. It gets to the elevator hall, and it just says, can you please push that button and hold the elevator door? And whoever is around will push the elevator button. If there is no one around, the, re the robot repeats again three times to the air, can you please push the elevator button? And the person tells which elevator is going up. Everything the robot asks, the person says. But then the robot goes in by itself, beautifully. That doesn't need anybody to teleoperate it. Enters the elevator and again says, uh, can you please press 8 and tell me when I get to that floor? And the person nicely and, and generously tells you are on 8. And there goes the robot, thank you, and it's on its own. So what happens is that all our robots have limitations and throughout the task of moving in these, you know, meters and meters in the building, there is a little bit they cannot do and they ask for help. Now, it can occur to you, so what happens if these robots, nobody helps the robot? Which happens? What happens, what help? Guess what, they send us email. And they say, I've been blocked by an obstacle for more than three minutes. Can someone come and help and rescue me? Or, you know, I've waited for more than five minutes for a response. Nobody helped me. What? So beautifully, they have these templates, about six or about up to ten messages they can send about situations for which they ask for help. They fill in the location. And I could be teaching a class and I get this email. And it sends to Coral Group, the Coral Cobot, which are about like five of us. We all get this email, and whoever is available goes and helps them. So if they ask for help for people around. If nobody helps, they send us email. If we don't help it within some threshold of time, they go happily back to the lab, and they don't do anything else. They just go back. They abort the task, send email to the person. I'm not going to be able to bring you your coffee, so I'm sorry, I have to go back to the lab. That's it. 
very beautiful this concept of having, having been able to create kind of like complete autonomy, even if not perfect autonomy. So here is an example of how they go to the web. And here I have sound, I don't know if this will work. Will this work? I don't know. No. So, uh, so bring, So here the, the person, so the robot is asked for coffee, does not know the location of coffee in the building, and issues queries uh, using object eval, which is another PhD thesis, on where is coffee in the building. And in fact, it's not where is coffee in the building. The robot asks uh, the following statement, how true is coffee in kitchen? How true is coffee in office? in printer room, in bathroom, in conference room. So all the locations that the robot knows asks the web what's the probability of such thing being in these locations. And then So it knows where the lab is, and there you go, it's all happy. Now it knows coffee. It knows that it needs to go to 7412, and it just keeps going to the, it knows where the kitchen is, 7602, which in its map it's 7602. And now I can ask you, so how does it get coffee by the kitchen? How does it get coffee by the kitchen? Ask for help. It's there, it's a, hello, could you please put the object coffee in my basket? and let me know when I can go. And there's Maddie, puts coffee on it. It's actually an empty cup. Uh, and uh, thank you, there you go. And there you go, and it's done. So beautifully, this robot again transports books. I, I mean, no, my secretary, my assistant, never goes to the lab when a package comes on the mail. She calls Cobot, puts the package on Cobot, and says, take it to the lab. Constantly, this cobot goes between my assistant's office and the lab, I don't know, n times a week, whenever we have, or, and, uh, and that's what it does all day. The beautiful thing is that it learns, uh, and here is just a snapshot of the, the actual file, it learns that coffee is in 7602 with some weight, proportional to probabilities, one way or another, learns everything. It has learned more than 10,000 facts just by interacting with people about coffee, chocolate, labs, conference rooms, classrooms, uh, Manuela's office, everything, all by interaction. So this is like the role of the human, uh, is like teaching the robot just by use. All these things are learned, and from now on, if you ask, I mean, I have another video in which you ask the cobot for coffee, it doesn't go to the lab anymore, and offers 7602 as a, pos a possible location. So finally, I want to tell you about the most novel thing, which is this problem of trying to understand autonomy. So when we see the robots doing something, we might wonder to know why did they do this. So here is an example from robot soccer in which if you would not, if you would see that this is the ball, these are two teams, ours is, uh, it doesn't matter, the team that's going to score, it doesn't matter, <laughs> you'll see. But what matters is like this, you don't know really what they are doing, but they are running code, and this video does not show anything. So what we are working on is to explain what's happening by showing what the planner is doing. So the planner plans to send there, you see, now it's going to plan to send there, and eventually, we are able to uh, show what's going on, and we, are, we have a whole thesis, a PhD thesis, on annotating uh, a video directly and autonomously from the run of the brain of the robots. In some sense, here is an example of a drone that is planning to go from here to some place, and this drone is planning a route, and we are projecting on the video, on the real video, the planner uh, generating a route, and then the person can see, uh, it, it can explain why is the robot moving this way, 
or how, what is the robot doing? And when the robot stops, I mean, there is a lot of meaning here, is eventually you have a cross where it is and the pink where it's going. And there you go, these red lines are the obstacles we created virtually. And if we didn't have these particular kind of annotations, it was completely opaque what the robots were doing. And here is an example again of a very beautiful pass that occurred in 2015. And here is the explanation of what happened. The robot plans, should I pass to this one, this one, or that one? The evaluation, the probabilistic evaluation says pass here. And then this one passes over there. There it goes, oh, sorry, start it again. Uh, just, I cannot touch it for a second. And then eventually uh, it passes, there you go, it passes there. Uh, we are sh sh uh, showing these at slow motion, otherwise people don't understand. Again, what the planner does, this is all the reasoning behind the actions, and it shoots at the goal immediately the prediction that the ball, because it hit on the side, is going there. That robot goes there. Here it's what's planning, is to pass there. Eventually it passes there. This one here misses the pass, you'll see. Uh, Robotics at its best, you know, the uncertainty. Immediately tries to recover, evaluate, should I pass back, should I shoot? Determines that the probability of scoring is higher and eventually it shoots. So this is like something that is very dear to our heart for robots, which is this transparency. We want to be able to ask, what are you going to do? What's your internal state? What happened by the elevator? How did it happen? So for Cobot, we actually have it now show much more of its internal state and is able to actually, uh, sorry, uh, put, uh, show lights about being, uh, when it's blocked, when it's waiting, when it's actually escorting someone, it has a progress bar. This was very, very important. We did some human studies that the fact that you have a blinking light is much better than just saying, please press the elevator button. The blinking red light calls the attention that the robot needs help. It shows whether it's turning left or right. It can show many more things to make like humans more aware of what's happening. And the final comment is about actually explaining what's happening. Look at this. A robot lives in the, the world of numbers. It lives in the world of geometry. It lives in the world of matrices. It lives in the world of uh, all sorts of like predictions that have nothing to do with what we understand. It's uh, really opaque. Uh, even like we, we look at 7711 and 7711 for the robot is some kind of XY location in a map. The zero zero is at the elevator and the robots function in another world. So their brain, the way they function, has nothing to do with what we understand. This is an angle in radians. I mean, what is going on? 1.57, one one what is that thing? Mine is 1.57. So the first thing we did to try to generate explanations is that we uh, annotated this. Uh, we actually l did not learn these annotations. We uh, semantically uh, uh, annotate the map. And like what's beautiful is that when we have a route that the robot traversed, went from the lab, took the elevator, came all the way here, we are able to have the robot generate explanations of what's happening when we ask. Uh, I traveled 26 meters and took 152 seconds on the seventh floor, and we can have different levels of explanation, more detailed, less detailed, more local, and so we introduced this concept of a verbalization space in which the robot now does not speak always and does not explain always in the same way, but it can explain at different levels of specificity, locality, and abstraction. is a 3D kind of like a, a space, and it generates explanations differently, and it can be extremely detailed about the description of what happened. I started blah, I went through these, I took this route, I took the floor, bridge, blah, 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 or less. The beautiful thing you do is that we were able to learn, and this is my last slide, to learn to correctly infer an explanation level uh, uh, through the dialogue with people. So here is the space of the verbalization space, and when the robot offers an explanation, if the person says, please tell me exactly how you got here, that means some point in this explanation space, 
But if the human then says, okay, now only tell me what happened near the room 7004, beautifully the robot navigates in the explanation space and is able to revise the explanation according to these tell me only what happened at that room goes down in locality. And eventually if you say, can you give me a brief summary, again it moves to a different space, different point in this space. So what we did was learning how does this language, uh, how does this language map to uh, positions, uh, different explanations that the robot now generates autonomously. And uh, it's a very beautiful paper and very nice results. I didn't put here more of the results, but that the robot basically always uh, learned really well how to uh, uh, respond to these requests, brief summary, only on room blah, exactly. And these terms are used consistently uh, to, uh, to uh, map into the specific points in the space. So in conclusion, uh, I just talk, tell you, told you about these service autonomous robots that move around, and then I went through these uh, interaction with humans along the fact that they ask for help, they can learn from humans in terms of where's the kitchen, where's the coffee, where's the actual uh, location of ob office, and then this is the one of the last more, uh, I think what we are going to work more on the years to come is on having our AI systems be more transparent and being able to explain themselves and being able to be corrected and being able to reveal more of what's happening in their internals when they make decisions for us. Thank you very much.